So uh, first, uh, we have a presentation. Why? Jason Booth. Uh, Jason, welcome to measure. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. It's an honor to be here, and um, I've been here two years now at the YMCA, and um, feels like about two weeks. So, <laughs> but as you'll see in the presentation. Just a tidbit of uh, the exciting stuff we have going on and what we've been doing uh, for a long time in this community, but specifically in the last two years. Um, first question is a lot I get a lot is what is the YMCA? You know, what are we? Um, we're just you're just a gym and you're just a pool, correct? No, no, no. There's a lot more than that. We cast a very wide net, um, and our mission though is to help community members live their live lives to the fullest potential by putting Christian principles into practice. Programs that build healthy spirit, mind, and body. What does that mean? Well, it means a lot. Um, and as you can see, more than more than just a gym and a swim. Yes, we have that. People come to the YMCA to work out. They come to the YMCA to get swim lessons, swim team. That's a huge part of what we do. In addition to that, youth development. We have childcare. We have uh, before and after school programs. I'll get into that a little bit more in just a bit. With some of the expansion we started just this fall, we have our preschool. Um, we have summer camps youth sports, we have STEAM education programs, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math in the evenings. Um, we're about health and wellness as well. We have chronic disease prevention programs such as Delay the Disease, uh, Parkinson's, uh, Live Strong for cancer survivors, a lot of healthy living initiatives. In addition, we have uh, community engagement is really what we're about. Uh, YMCA does not come into a community and say, here's what we're going to do for the community. It needs to take a pause and say, what does the community need? And that's where YMCA feels needs. And uh, that is in many, many different forms. Volunteer opportunities, food and, uh, food and blood drives that we're doing. We actually have a vaccine clinic from the health department on Monday, COVID and flu vaccines for free. Um, we have a lot of programs designed for seniors, disaster relief. Uh, shortly after I got here, we got a call from the Red Cross. There was an apartment fire um, and it displaced about five families. Hey, could we, use the YMCA for temporary shelter, absolutely. And I think we hosted maybe two families for a couple nights. It was wonderful. Uh, community events, service agency partnerships. So we have partnerships uh, funded partially by the United Way with approximately 23 nonprofits in, in town that give free, we give free memberships so they can use for clients. We also have uh, discounted memberships for other agencies in town. For example, the county, we have about 35 County employees have memberships with us that get 15% off. Uh, we have it with the city. We have it with about 50 different organizations in town. Uh, family services, parent support programs, and Healthy Kids Day, and uh, which is an annual YMCA event uh, every spring that we invite the community into the YMCA to have activities and, and programs to promote healthy living for kids. Uh, and we're an inclusive space. We're a place for everyone. Uh, we, we, uh, our, our goal is to not turn anyone away for lack of ability to pay. Um, Granted, we can't just give it away for free, but we drastically discount for those that are in financial need up to 65% off. Um, and we want to be a place for everyone. Um, and that is not just us, that is the YMCA is across the country. So that's just a little bit about what the YMCA, YMCA is, but I want to highlight some of the successes that we've had uh, just in the last couple of years. In 2023, our membership grew 16.5%. Um, COVID did a number on us as it did a lot of things. Um, uh, Planet Fitness also took uh, a lot of our business away, but those that those customers have returned, and our membership is uh, at a higher level than it was before COVID. So we have recovered from that. And then in 2024, or, uh, this current year, we are currently at a 13% increase over a 16.5% increase year before. So membership is very strong. Um, our services. Um, uh, financial assistance and services in 2023 exceeded $145,000. So that's the discounted memberships I referred to. That's free, uh, the um, service partnerships that we do with United Way. Um, and our current membership is just over 5,900 members plus over 2,200 for seniors through healthcare plan membership, silver sneakers, active fit, et cetera, that they get their memberships um, included with their healthcare uh, health plan. And they, and we get paid based on the number of uses that they use. So over, um, over almost over 8,000 members um, in total, 5,900 that are paying. Key partnerships and community engagement, I just want to touch on some things that 
happen again. This is just the tip of the iceberg of the exciting things we have going on. We recently received funding from the state, um, $550,000 as part of the OTS CIF funds to help replace our dehumidifier in the window pool. Uh, the window pool is constantly in use, 25 yard, eight lane um, competition pool that there are five high schools that practice and compete in it. And our Lancaster Y youth swim team, about 110 kids are in it. So it is busy on top of all the classes and just the open swim times that we have. That's one of two pools we have at the Sixth Avenue facility. The other one is the Fox Pool, which is the original. It was built in 1960. Uh, the window pool was built in 2000, but the dehumidifier to uh, service that airspace, the air space in, the, in that room uh, has failed. Uh, the state stepped in with that money to help us with that. They saw a, a need there. So that is on order. Of course, it doesn't happen overnight. It's about a year wait for that. So we are making making do for the next year, but we are grateful for that funding. Uh, and we have provided, uh, these are the, the local nonprofit service agencies I mentioned, 226 free memberships um, that have been used over 2,200 times just in the last 12 months from July to June of 24, July of 23 to June of 24. So they're getting, they're getting used. Um, and we're constantly promoting that, pushing those for those agencies to use that as much as possible. And I, I touched on before and after care. We're very excited that uh, this fall we have started before and after care in Bloom Carroll uh, Elementary School and the Fairfield Union Elementary Schools. So those are underway. So we have staff in place uh, from six, uh, starting at six in the morning until school starts, and then at three o'clock until six o'clock after school to uh, take care of the kids that just don't that, that need some attention without going home to an empty house. Um, without going to a different child care. They're in the schools, the parents drop them off at the school, they pick them up at the school, no transportation needed. So that is off to a good start. And we're, we're excited to watch that grow uh, and potentially expand it into other uh, outer lying school districts. Lancaster has their own after school program. Um, so we're not affiliated with that at all. That is uh, Lancaster School District handling that, but we wanna take care of the other needs around uh, Lancaster. Uh, looking towards the future, we just launched a uh, new three-year strategic plan, and you have, uh, commissioners, you have a copy of that in, in your packet um, to read it here at your leisure. Uh, but it's it's only three years because once you, if you have a five-year plan, once you're year two or three into it, you're, it's pretty much shot. Uh, for example, we had one that just finished in 2019, and then the spring of 2020, just completely like that. So that plan was basically shelved, and we started new with this one. Pretty exciting. Uh, there are some aggressive things in there. We do are looking to uh, have a capital campaign to renovate the Sixth Avenue facility. Uh, as again, that was built in 1960. Uh, the addition was added with the window pool and our beautiful wellness center in 2000, uh, but that's 24 years old. Uh, so it needs some uh, aesthetic renovations. Uh, we, we've done a lot uh, in the last three years. Uh, redoing the parking lots, uh, new roof over the old building, refinish the basketball floors, the dehumidifier, we put a lot of investment in the building, but it needs more. So we're gonna look at a capital campaign to, to finish that off. With the goal is in 2027, we will be celebrating our 100th year in Eastern Fargo County. So 1927 was the YMCA's start. The YWCA has been in town longer. Um, but we merged in, in 1980. So um, as, as a YMCA, it'll be 100 years in 2027. But I also want to just have a, this question out there for anyone, and, and specifically the commissioners, what else can we do? Uh, as I mentioned, the YMCA doesn't come in and say, here's what we're going to do. We want to sit back and say, how can we help? What are the needs? There may be something, there may be a need out there that we can help with, and we may not even know that we can help with it until we're asked. Uh, and come up with a way. There are YMCA's across the country that help with uh, things that we don't even do. Um, public housing, for example. Central Ohio has public housing. Um, there, there are many, many programs that the YMCA can do and has that we can tap into to do those resources. So I'll just leave you with that, and I don't know if there's any questions, but um, very high level, we're very excited for the future and what we can do for, for not just Lancaster, but very good taxes. Mr. President, thank you for being with us today. I appreciate your presentation. Um, and my memory may not be accurate from like when I was 10 or something, you know, because I'm 60, so I might have some things wrong. But what I recall anyway is during the summer, 
when my mother and stepfather were both working uh, then drop me off at the Y. I would pay my quarter. <clears throat> I'd be there for the day, and then they'd pick me up at night. Other days, I might go to grandma's or somewhere else, like whatever. But most days, as I recall anyway, I'd be dropped off there and pay my quarter and play ball and dodgeball and basketball and stuff like that for the day. How does that look today? Uh, well, we're not seeing as much of those kind of just drop off and, and there all day. We do have summer camp program, obviously, that a lot of uh, families take advantage of, and they're there all day uh, with programming. But it is available uh, to members that uh, want to do that, that nothing's stopping them from working out, or swimming, playing basketball. There's plenty to do. Uh, we're not seeing it. Uh, I've heard those stories many times of kids that just grew up there and were just there all day. Uh, we don't see that as much. Uh, I don't know the reasons why. If they're, um, you know, at home with electronics, or they have other uh, ways to to occupy their time. I'm going to walk that a little further if I could. So, if the well, young, I don't really care what their age is, but if some young parents want their child to be at the Y all day on a summer day, yep. Way they accomplish that is by being members. Correct. And is there any mechanism for a non-member to pay for that service and also have that? That I want to drop my kid off for the day service. They would have to come with a member. Um, but yes, on, the members can also bring guests for free. They have five guest passes they can use in a year. Um, so there, there are ways to do that as non-members, not as regular and routine. The main reason why we have to screen all of our members for uh, registered sex offender status. Um, and so we can have guests on occasion, but they have to be with a member because of our child care licensing, and especially when we have summer camp in the building. Um, we we need to be screening that. Now, you know, that is not a reason to stop kids from coming and, and being there, but within those parameters of being a, a guest of a member or a member. But, but you're, I'm gathering what you're saying that, that in terms of let's just say programming which might not be the right word but if a membership family drops their child off at the y on a summer day there's not programming designed for that child they just have the run of the y so to speak during the summer yes um no not necessarily because of summer camp that is there and has most of the spaces occupied. Um, there are things that, on you know, from uh, session to session, that there might be an hour here or an hour there, where there might be. Uh, it's probably more like in the evening where there'd be youth programming, um, because that's summer camp leaves and then opens up spaces for them. One last There's comment, if I might, Mr. President. So, in terms of your question to the community, so to speak, the commission has spent a tremendous amount of time and money on addressing impediments that working families are experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're attempting to address that from a skill standpoint. Do they have the skills they need to get to work? Right. Trying to sort right. that out through the Workforce Center. Um, mm -hmm. We're on the eve of developing some additional uh, transit plans. How are they getting back and forth to work? Right. Um, we're, Working on housing solutions for folks who are in that basket, so to speak. Um, if we were to select a fourth impediment after skills, housing, and transportation, it would be child care yep. in terms of what want to work are experiencing as an impediment to work. Yep. And so, not just you, but wherever we go. Yeah. We're communicating a concern about what we would describe as the fourth impediment. Yeah, no, we've heard that many times over. And um, we we can offer childcare, um, but we're limited as well. Now we're not full, um, and I'm going to be pushing to increase those opportunities. Um, could that include just parents dropping their kids off? Possibly, um, but they have to be older than you know 13 or over to be in the building by themselves as a member. You can't be nine years old and just running around the building uh, without without uh, someone that is 13 or old. But 
it's an option. Uh, it's not a great option for those kids, uh, to be honest, but that's we will certainly look at that and look at that programming. If that is something that you're saying is push kids here, we will we'll probably have things in place for them. I think if I might, Mr. President, I checked out the responsibility for solving that problem on the why. I don't mean oh, to yeah. suggest that. But we want to help. We want to be a resource. Question whether there's a question of the ability to all participate and solve the right problem. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank yeah, you, sir. Absolutely. So, in addition to uh, especially the child care aspect, well, what is your capacity for child care? For child care, yes. Currently, we have um, preschool ages three to five in our uh, Sixth Avenue facility. We have one classroom right now, but we have three uh, rooms that um, we are looking to expand into to have more child care. We just have, we have a transition right now of our director, um, and we have a partnership that we're getting ready to announce that will um, partner with the YMCA of Central Ohio to provide guidance and supervision for us, uh, but it will greatly expand our capacity to have those those rooms full. So this past week, uh, the Gazette actually did an article regarding child care and the cost thereof. That's a major impediment to this. Yep. The annual cost of about twelve thousand dollars, and somewhere in excess of ten dollars per hour. And so yep. that uh, it's a big deal. Yeah. So I would encourage you to do whatever it takes. Oh yeah, we have uh, the discount programs that we already offer. Plus, we also work with Job Fan Services, and we are uh, four star rated uh, with JFS, and then which will now be gold. Uh, gold, silver, bronze will be the ratings, and will be gold. Um, so we can provide funding for those families in need. Um, we have a lot of uh, uh, of children that are in our care that are getting state assistance, uh, be it at before and after care programs, summer camp, or preschool. So we can be that place for those families. That's what we're there for. Uh, it's not to make a profit, you know, you know, make all kinds of money on families and kids. We want to be that resource for them to Thanks. Yeah, so uh, Jim and I had a chance to, to sit down and talk a few weeks ago, and I'm um, really impressed. Um, and we are working on workforce development and housing and transportation. And we all know that daycare is the next thing. We're starting to kind of work through that, you know, what that looks like and uh, how we can pull different groups together to help with that. So certainly appreciate your willingness to be a part of the solution down the road. Um, I, you know, my general thought is when a, a place has been a part of the community for 100 years, um, you know, there's probably an opportunity for it to just be taken for granted and, and just kind of exist, right? Yeah. Um, and the thing that I came away with from our meeting a few weeks ago was the the energy and the enthusiasm and the push to really reinvigorate the YMCA and to take it to a new level. And uh, you know, you've got a tremendously interesting background, um, and I think that that will help you move this thing forward. So I'm excited for the future of the Y. I'm excited for your. Uh, leadership there, and uh, you know anything we as commissioners can do. You know, as you've asked us, what what can yep. we do to help? We're going to ask you the same thing. What can we do to help you? So, really appreciate you being here. Really, generally appreciate all that you're doing out there. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. And one thing I also say is, not only do we have our facility for childcare, as we've done with our before and after care programs, we can do it outside of our facility. So, if there's a um, I know I've mentioned to Rick very briefly, like if there's a need for us to offer childcare. At the workforce center, just an idea or something along those lines. We can be a satellite. We can come to places to offer the services. It doesn't have to be in our confines of the Sixth Avenue facility. So, another question I wanted to ask by Mike is: you, you may mention uh, uh, a capital campaign near term. Yep. And I'm just curious as to when that. If that hasn't already been done, when that begins, and if you have a target, a budget, yep. and all that. We are working through that right now. The sensitivity we have is I realize there are other entities in town doing capital campaigns right now. I know the resources are limited. Are you uh, in the black right now? With the United Way, we are, yes. Um, however, 
the board, our, our board of directors is looking through options of researching and having uh, the analysis done of exactly not how much to raise, but to how much to raise for what. Like, how are we going to renovate the building to meet programming needs? Uh, expanded childcare, you know, something else, we don't know. Um, and so we're exploring all those preparatory steps in order before we actually launch a campaign. You could argue that we've already launched a quiet phase of the campaign because we've got 550,000 towards a dehumidifier, which is going to be a big part of our campaign. My guess, if we were to renovate and do things, it's anywhere between three and five million dollars. That could be low, that could be high. Um, but we haven't done those exploratory uh, findings with architects yet. We haven't engaged with one yet to get the answers to know exactly. Let's just raise five million and renovate. Let's do it specifically for what we want to do. And that way it might be, oh, we only need two and a half. Oh, no, you need eight. We, we don't know that yet. Anyway, uh, you know, and we're thankful uh, to our state legislators, uh, Jeff Ray and so. Senator Schaefer and Kevin Miller, yep. being very proactive in helping and hopefully they can provide additional help in the future. Yes. Yeah, they all visited the facility individually, and uh, that was a huge part of getting their support for that demon fire, and they're, they're very helpful, very supportive. So on a side note, we, we have our own uh, Corey Clark and Emily Portable yep. that serve our board as yes. well. So very excited to have each of them on the board. Um, they'll bring tremendous resources and insight and, and knowledge to help us accomplish our goals. Any other final question? Thank you, Jason. Okay, thanks for thank you very time. much. Sorry, I do. Okay. As you're going about having these kinds of conversations, let's just say for purpose of discussion that we're shouting child care. Um, what's, what's the second hearing, or have you gotten that far yet? After child care, is there another chorus of battle calls for and this? What's and this? Child care is, is, is over resounding uh, one right now. Um, I would say there's a bunch of smaller ones that are, for example, uh, obesity, um, just healthiness in the community. Um, Engagement, uh, a lot of isolation, uh, specifically in the senior population, uh, just being that place for them, uh, having the capacity to offer more programs or things like that, um, do more things that that people want. For example, uh, we don't. I don't want to work out, but I want to come and engage in something. Maybe that's a walking club, it's a hiking club, and just expanding our program offerings um, uh, to do to provide things that the people want. Uh, but child care is by far and away the, the biggest area of need. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Jason. Thank you very much for the opportunity. You don't have to stay for the remainder of our meeting. I know you want to, but I'm also, I'm also sure you're quite friendly. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. So we have with us today uh, Scott Brown from the State Auditor's uh, Office. And I understand Scott has an award to present. Is that correct? Thank you. Yes, I do have an award today. So thank you for allowing me a few minutes on your agenda. Um, <clears throat> my name is Scott Brown. I serve as the state auditor, the uh, I serve state auditor in Keith Faber as his Central Ohio liaison. As many of you in this room know, that means that hopefully I'm the first person you call if you have a question from the state auditor's office. Um, it's my honor to be here today on behalf of Auditor Faber to present the to present Fairfield County with the Auditor of State Award with Distinction. Um, this award puts your organization in a very select group. We, of our 6,000 clients um, statewide, we audit nearly 4,200 of those annually, and just 4% of those, uh, those audits qualify for this award. Um, the Auditor of State Award with Distinction is presented to local governments uh, and other entities upon the completion of a financial audit that meet these criteria to be considered a clean audit report or, as many of you know, a short letter from our office. Um, the entity must file financial reports with the Auditor's Office by a statutory due date without, ex without extension on a gap 
accounting basis and prepare a comprehensive annual financial report. The audit report does not contain any findings for recovery, material citations, material weaknesses, significant deficiencies, uniform guidance findings, or other questioning costs. Drinking through government speed, what this uh, award represents is the hard work of all of Fairfield County's staff and employees who make every effort each day to attain accounting excellence. We'd like to recognize the administration and the finance office that have done an outstanding job watching over every dollar. What this truly means is across your entire organization, you have the people and the processes in place that understand fiscal accountability. Specifically, we want to recognize County Auditor Carrie Brown for her leadership, professionalism, and exceptional commitment to fiscal integrity. So on behalf of Auditor Keith Faber, I'd like to present the Fairfield County, I would like to present Fairfield County with the Auditor of State Award with distinction. I'm happy to answer any questions. And so we'll, we'll be doing a photo op up above, but in the meantime, Dr. Brown, if you could please come forward. Thank you to Scott for coming to Fairfield County to present this award on behalf of Auditor Keith Faber. I also want to say thank you to every elected official and department head for their leadership, their dedication to financial stewardship, and most importantly to our finance team. I'd like for Beth Hoskinson to join me. Beth is our financial systems director. She has more than three decades of experience in the state and local offices, and she is a tremendous asset to Fairfield County. I'm so glad that she's part of our team. We are um, reaching out to all of our stakeholders and doing a lot of education and outreach, particularly with our Making Numbers Count, the Financial Leadership Academy, and it is Bev's leadership that is moving that along and promoting it, and I appreciate that very much. So we expect many more of these to um, come along with the many more that we've had in the past and appreciate this long history of financial stewardship. Please join us up, Bob. Do I see them? Bye. <laughs> One, two, three. One, two, three. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So we've uh, reached the point of our meeting where we allow public comment. If you wish to do so, please approach the podium and give your name and address, and you are limited to three minutes. Who would like to be first? Thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Ed Mulholland. I live in Muskingum County. I've been a resident of Ohio for 37 years. We're volunteers, not spokespersons, with United Sovereign Americans. United Sovereign Americans is a nationwide volunteer organization of thousands of active volunteers. United Sovereign Americans' highly credentialed national data team has gathered data showing alarming discrepancies in our state's database. Using only official data provided by our state elections officials of the 2022 election, our audit shows that the 2022 election may not have been accurate or legally compliant. We're not saying one candidate won over another that any election should be overturned. 
It's simply that the state's official data from a certified election shows that the votes as counted were not all valid and accurate under existing law. While the numbers are staggering, one thing's clear. They don't add up. Roger knows about making numbers add up. Next, we'll read you uh, a resolution for a legally valid 2024 election. The summary of findings and request for investigation has already been shared with state election officials and law enforcement. And we just want elected officials to understand these issues and uh, that they need to be taken seriously. So, a resolution for a legally valid 2024 general election, whereas it is a recognized civil right in the United States for every citizen to have free and fair elections. Quote, and the right of suffrage can be denied by a debasement or dilution of the weight of a citizen's vote just as effectively as by wholly prohibiting the free exercise of the franchise. That's from Reynolds v. Sims. And whereas it is the duty of our election officials to guarantee our elections are accurate and free from distortion and manipulation, quote, Congress seeks to guard the election of members of Congress against any possible unfairness by compelling everyone concerned in holding the election to a strict and scrupulous observance of every duty devolved upon him while so engaged. The evil intent consists in disobedience to the law, end quote. That's from N. Ray Foy. And whereas our constitutional system of representative government only works when the following four tenets of an election are upheld. The voter rolls must be accurate, National Voter Registration Act 1993. Votes counted must be from eligible voters, according to the U.S. Constitution, 14th Amendment, Section 2. The number of votes counted must equal the number of voters who voted. And four, there can be no more than one in 125,000 ballots in error by the voting system, in accordance with the Help America Vote Act 2000. Please conclude your remarks. My name is Hannah Moore. I live in Miskingham County and have been a resident there most of my life. Continuing on, whereas an open source audit of the Ohio 2022 general election conducted by Ohio State citizens has uncovered evidence of massive inaccuracies that violate both federal and state laws, including 1,046,431 ineligible or uncertain registration violations found within the Ohio State Voter Rule Database. 602,631 votes cast by ineligible or uncertain registrants. 1,162,079 more votes counted than voters who voted in the 22 general, 2022 general election at the time of certification. No one knows who cast them. 713,262 apparent voting violations in excess of the legal standard of system accuracy for a valid federal election. Maximum allowable system errors for the 2022 general election in Ohio is 34. Certification as defined by law and attestation of accuracy and compliance appears to have been fraudulent and illegal. Whereas these findings trample legal accuracy requirements of the voting system during a federal election. Accuracy is defined as the ability of the system to capture and report specific selections and absence of selections made by a voter without errors. Whereas the intent of the voters must be known factually before certification can be lawfully conducted. Certification of an election that varies from the law is an abridgment of the civil rights of the citizens. Fraud of Anicio, United States v. Throckmorton, 1878. Quote, from time immemorial, an election to public office has been, in point of substance, no more and no less than the expression by qualified electors of their choice of candidates, United States, end quote, United States v. Classic, 1941. Whereas Ohio's 2022 general election appears to have been invalid, depriving us of the guaranteed protection of our natural rights under a government that duly and provenly chosen by us, the American people, resulting in incalculable damage to our families, our way of life, and the fabric of the United States. My name is Cheryl Phoebus. I live in Muskingum County and have been a resident of Ohio for over 21 years. To continue with the resolution, 
Therefore, we call upon our representatives to provide relief to the people and the assurance of domestic tranquility by joining us in demanding a valid 2024 general election that holds these existing laws and equitable principles of law. Number one, proof of citizenship, identity, and eligibility to register and vote, not anonymous attestation. Number two, voter rolls certified accurate and available for public review and challenge 30 days before the start of early voting. Voters added after that date must bring proof of citizenship, identity, and address in person to a qualified official at each polling place. Number three, hand-marked secure ballots similar to currency. Where imaging technology is used for tabulation, the security features must be verifiable in the ballot image. Number four, systems, machines, security measures, infrastructure, and conduct are required to be compliant with federal law for fraud prevention regarding risk assessment, certification, testing, and implementation. Number five, adjudication must be signed off by party, candidate, and train citizen witnesses after being given full and effective observation rights. Candidates and trained citizens must be allowed immediate access to ballots, ballot imaging, and CDRs, or cast vote records. Number six, ballots, regardless of entry source, election operations, and systems must maintain end-to-end -end chain of custody from voter to vote count to final canvas, including auditability and witness transfer with paper records. Number seven, a NIST or National Institute Standards and Transmissions compliant, randomized, statistically valid, end-to-end -end audit with a 95% confidence level of all elections pursuant to the 14th Amendment, Section 2 must be performed. These audits are to be conducted by qualified, insured, and bonded security, forensics or financial auditors, not personnel from within the election system. Reconciliation will include the vote count, real physical ballots, adjudication, CDRs, ballot count, qualified voter count, custody transfer, and all other paper and electronic election systems, including logs. Number eight, if the total of all unique variances above is more than 10% of the margin of victory, a new election must be held in the state for those candidates affected unless the issues can be provably corrected by a manual hand count and a full review of records. Number nine, waiver of re requirements is not allowed. Only end-to-end -end system compliance from registration through certification can guarantee the intent of the people is accurately recorded. Thank you. Could I have your full address, please, besides Muskingum County? I'm sorry? Your full address. Yes, 956 Taylor Street in Zanesville, Ohio. Thank you. My name is Cindy Thompson. I live in Muskingum County and have been a resident of Ohio all my life. You have just heard a powerfully written resolution for a legally valid 2024 general election. The resolution outlined massive inaccuracies from our 2022 election, from registration through certification. It asked for meaningful remedies to proactively protect our civil rights by having a valid 2024 general election for all Americans. The resolution cited many United States Supreme Court precedents that support the need for such actions. Existing election laws should not be ignored. Bottom line, just like your checkbook must balance, so must our votes, but that's not happening. The system that controls our most important right to choose our representatives is not producing an accurate, trustworthy result. Our election system, which is part of our national security infrastructure, can't continue to be ignored. Americans have a civil right to a free, fair, and legally valid election. The resolution demands this by applying and enforcing existing voter laws. The cost to not fix the problem is immeasurable. So I encourage you to support upholding the voter laws by signing this resolution and voting yet. The United Sovereign Americans website, Unite for Freedom, showcases our nationwide initiatives and has very informative videos that explain the anomalies and apparent violations of law that are found in Ohio and other states in our country. The website is unite, 
the number four, freedom.com. I encourage you to learn more about United Sovereign Americans at uniteforfreedom.com. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Who would like to be next, please? Sherry Pimer, 3464 South Bank Road, Miller Court, Walnut Township. Um, of course, we're still fighting against the big uh, solar project, Eastern Cottontail, and the clock is ticking. Um, today, I'm going to present to you some additional um, petitions that we have signed. On these petitions, are we've got over 300 people from Fairfield County. Um, signing the petitions. In addition to that, we've got 300 and I believe 45 or so from outside Fairfield County, but in Licking, Perry, and the you know surrounding areas uh, that are also against industrial solar. But what that also means is that people that stop by our booth at some of these festivals, 345 or 346 people were from outside the area. So we have a lot of people coming in to visit Fairfield County. And there's a reason for that. It's because of Fairfield County. They like the country. They like the small town feel. They like the festivals. They, I mean, Fairfield County gives people a reason to visit. And we want to keep it that way. And by bringing in big industrial solar taking up valuable farmland and also future development areas around the small villages. That's where the expansion is according to our land use plan, which is the way it should be. And I know uh, Commissioner Fix has worked really hard at this for the last year or two and, and everybody appreciates it. And I go to a lot of the, the village meetings and the, and the uh, township trust or the township meetings and they do appreciate it and they are coming along and um, I don't you probably already know that one of the villages has been contacted by an attorney that has uh, a, a landowner who wants to annex into that village because they want to put solar on it because they know that they can't do it by the township since it's unincorporated and we have an exclusionary zone so this is the way they're trying to work their way around is by going into places who, who don't have you know the the additional zoning for that um, i'm going to give these to rochelle And we're asking to, for you to uh, sign a letter of opposing Eastern Cottontail because you do have the authority to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Who, who would like to be next, please? Very good. Thank you all for coming. Amy, anything else? Like Unless you, anybody has questions. Any administrative updates on a all right. Uh, just a reminder, Fairfield County offices will be closed this Friday. Uh, we will be uh, encouraging all of our folks to go out and celebrate the Fairfield County Fair. Tomorrow we will hold our employee benefits fair um, at the Records Center from 12 to 5. That's an opportunity for employees to obtain information or ask questions about our benefits program. And employees can also choose to have a biometric screening uh or get a flu shot provided by fmc so thanks to hr and our partners at fmc for helping us out with that um, we also wanted to share uh, good news about uh, a training grant uh, that economic development did recently engage in with uh rush creek uh, rick you want to talk a little bit more about that yeah so rush creek, rush creek theme supply uh is located in bremen they've been there for 60 years and uh they're more than 10 employees other successful small business in the county that serves our agricultural community and uh you're providing a ten thousand dollar training grant for them to uh, get some of their employee CPL license so a uh, great opportunity to help Bremen there's not a robust business uh businesses out in Bremen so it's great to help 
uh, some of these smaller communities. Awesome, and I, I also understand, I think there's some exploration going on at the engineer's office with folks uh, being able to provide CDL uh, training for folks. Uh, have we moved any, I'm looking at both Jason and uh, Jeremiah here. Do we have any additional information to share on that? We are, we are set up and we are kind of, you know, in the initial stages of learning our way through what we're doing. Kind of dot the I's, cross the T's, but we are a testing or training facility, I'm sorry. Awesome, and thank you for your willingness to explore that and make that a, an opportunity there. It is definitely needed. It's becoming a necessity for us to be able to get, continue to get qualified applicants and uh, just the number of applicants with the CDL that also had the construction experience. We're getting kind of thin, so we had to open the doors up somehow. Awesome, well, thank you very much. All right, highlights of resolutions. Uh, the review packet does contain a list of administrative approvals, and there are 23 resolutions on the agenda for the regular voting meeting today. A few that I will point out for you. There is a resolution to set a viewing and hearing date to determine the necessity to establish, alter, or widen a culvert on Stringtown Road. We have a resolution to vacate an alley in Walnut Township. The viewing and hearing for this petition were held on September 24th and October 1st, respectively. This vacation is for an unnamed alley in the Taylor's Sandy Beach area. We also have a re uh, resolution approving CS19, which sets forth responsible parties during the proposed project, and CS17, which is the cooperative agreement. And these are all relating to the 33 Pickerington Road project. And then we do have a resolution to vacate a portion of Allen Road for the 33 Pickerington Road project. This was tabled last week. and. Um, you can motion to uh, table that again or actually act on the resolution when we come to the voting meeting. There's a resolution to approve a contract between the commissioners and Meals on Wheels, older adult alternatives of Fairfield County to set forth respective duties in connection with the operation of Meals on Wheels and the funding and provision of services pursuant to the levy. And then lastly, there are two resolutions related to fees. The first is to adjust the fees for the five types of annexations, which the commissioners they have to consider. And the second is to establish a fee to file a road vacation, uh, asking the commissioners for consideration on these resolutions so that the costs uh, uh, will match up with the legal notices and required mailings that we have to do with that. Right now they are uh, coming in significantly lower than those costs that we experienced. Post COVID we have found that the legal advertising has significantly jumped. And this is allowed as per the High Revised Code. And Bert, I think your uh, budget review begins uh, this afternoon with budget meetings, right? Yes, we're good. Moving forward. Okay. All right. That's all I have. Uh, Rochelle, counter review invitations received. All right. The annual meeting of CT and AOSP Energy Program Committee will be October 16th. Then the CCAO boardroom at 209 East State Street, Columbus. The Wagner's Memorial Library will have a ribbon cutting for their new audio and video studio on October 16th at 4 p.m. in Micropolis. This studio will be available to the public for the cost of the library card. The Ohio Means Jobs Fairfield County Job Fair will be held at the Workforce Center on October 17th at 4 to 6 p.m. Fairfield Medical Center Foundation will host the Red Heart Gala on October 25th from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. at the Wagner's Memorial Library in Micropolis. The CCAO, CEAO, and Center Conference will be December 4th through 6th at the Columbus City Downtown Columbus. And MCJDC sent the commissioners an invitation for their holiday happenings event, which will be held at their facility on December 13th from 1030 up to 1230. Could you tap into that for me, please? Absolutely. Thank you. The commissioners received the following correspondence. A flyer on the Community Action and Fun Bus Adventure Step at Toronto Food Drive, which will run from November 16th to December 5th. The flyer contains an email address to schedule food pickup if you'd like to participate. A letter from Post Consumer Brands regarding updates to employee separations. An email from a resident regarding engine brakes on State Route 198. The CCAO County Spotlight on October 1st contained an article titled Lancaster Fairfield Public Transit Becomes Official Fairfield County Department. From the Office of the County Auditor, we have an October 2nd press release titled Fairfield County Auditor Updates, Levy Estimator Tool, and Fact Sheets for November 5th Election. The County Auditor also provided a memo regarding weights and measures outreach and a new fact sheet and wins the week. Fishers received additional correspondence and invitations from 4 H's regarding Fairfield County Fair's livestock sales. 
They also received correspondence regarding industrial solar projects. An email from Julie Graham Price from the Ohio Power Site and Work Community of Liaison regarding OPSB issuing Eastern Cocktail Solar a letter of completeness. A letter from Carnation Solar regarding a public meeting on October 10th at 5 p.m. at the Amanda Cliff Creek High School Auditorium. A newsletter from the county's Environmental Stewardship Committee and a newsletter from Visit Fairfield County. That's it. Thank you, Rochelle. Commissioner, I do have one more item. I uh, wanted to point out that we um, have uh, one of the transit buses out at the fairgrounds, and we are down to the final three choices for branding the bus, uh, Fairfield County Connect, Fairfield County Ride, and Fairfield County Link. So we are asking folks to uh, vote on one of those three items, and they uh, could do it via social media to get the I stopped looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm asking for a write in on Fairfield Area Regional Transit. I think that is the best of all opportunities. Yes, who wants to name it? Bart. <laughs> Powered by natural gas. <laughs> so, Link, Ride, or Connect uh, are your three options to choose from. Or a ride in. <laughs> And it is, uh, I, uh, we were out there yesterday. Um, it's kind of like a touch a truck uh, kind of um, uh, event as well. Kids are hopping on the transit bus. We're wanting the community to be able to see what transit looks like and how they too could um, take advantage of that if they had that need. So thanks to Rick and Aaron and the rest of the team, and especially Bennett, uh, because Bennett was the one that got everything set up for the fair. So that's very nice. Okay. Commissioner Davis, any old business? Yes, if I might, Mr. President, um, had the opportunity to attend the CCAO and CEAO regional um, meeting Friday, Champaign County. Um, I desperately did not want to go. <laughs> and I was certain I wouldn't learn a thing, uh, and, but it turned out that I was very happy I went. And I, I, I didn't come across, come across a question that I think we could maybe take a look at, uh, John. There was some discussion at that meeting regarding another round of bill funding being included in the state budgetary process, um, which I'm, I'm not concerned about that another round. But it was also suggested that there may still be funding available under the existing round of jail funding. And I found myself wondering whether our proposed fence at the jail site, whether that may or may not qualify under the existing jail funding grant opportunities. And so what I'm suggesting in that regard is, I, I know we're, the, the, the trains left the station, so to speak, in terms of getting that project moving, but I almost find myself wondering if the train could be slowed down until a determination is made regarding the availability or lack thereof of funding in that regard for that project. I'm sure, we can get that answer quickly. Yeah. And uh, so, anyway, I, I and the other thing I wanted to mention is the county we went to, Champaign County, um, smaller population, smaller government. Um, but what they do with what they have to work with, uh, I, I was pretty impressed by that. So shout out to our colleagues in Champaign County in that regard. Uh, uh, last note under old business, um, really, really well attended fair opening yesterday, uh, and then got the opportunity to kind of travel about a little bit uh, and uh, visit uh, a number of sites at the fairgrounds. Again, um, probably wasn't. Um, I, I was happy to be there. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, continuing to meet with uh, villages and townships on their land use plans and zoning and cooperative economic development agreements. Last week, uh, we had Walnut Township in Millersport, uh, Walnut Township in Thurston. Uh, we went to uh, Today we have Greenfield in Lancaster, and this afternoon we have um, last week uh, Holly and Tony and I got to go to uh, Pleasant Township. Their uh, 
working on their first land use plan in revising their zoning, which hasn't been revised in decades. Um, and I have to, you know, we always uh, give a shout out to the folks who are doing this, but um, the amount of work that Holly and her team are doing to help all these folks get their zoning up to date and get their maps done. Um, I, I don't know if you're keeping track of the hours, but it's got to be a ton. Because uh, every meeting we go to, uh, Holly volunteers her team to uh, make it happen. And really, without that, um, there's no way we can get that. So just a, a huge thanks to Holly. And uh, also, in every meeting we go to, Tony knows where all the pipes are buried and can very easily and quickly give answers as to what's possible, uh, what might be possible, and what's not possible. And that clarity. Uh, really helps folks figure out where they should look to uh, add development to their part of the county and where they should not. And so um, this really makes that all a lot, a lot smoother. So thank you, Tony, uh, and your team as well. So uh, we'll continue to push forward with all that. Uh, last Tuesday night, um, so nine months ago, I asked the uh, CCAO at one of the board meetings to put together what I called an Intel caucus basically a group of counties that could share, uh, you know, uh, best practices or what have impacts when an Intel is dropped in their county or next door or a Honda plant is dropped in their county or in the area. And uh, so we had a really good dinner with um, uh, one of the top people from the governor's development office, from the state economic development association and from the state um, Chamber of Commerce uh, and county commissioners from six different counties and a number of folks from uh, CCAO. We had this meeting in uh, Pickerington uh, over dinner. It's a great uh, two and a half hour conversation with more to come. And just the, I guess it shows the value of CCAO that they're able to to pull people from all these different areas together um, to you know figure out how we can all work together to maximize what happened you know take most advantage of what happens when these once in a lifetime opportunities present themselves that's all i have for old business do you any business yes um I had a couple meetings this morning um one was with uh clerk reports brandon meyer and what we were doing is just thinking about uh, some space utilization issues at uh, the Hall of Justice and uh, how things might be divvied up a little differently uh, in a couple of areas. Um, it's, it's probably premature for me at this point to get too far down the road on some of those ideas. I think there's some other folks we want to communicate with. Um, but to just kind of run that up the flagpole and, and see how that might get sorted out. But um, stay tuned on that issue. It's not a, um, I don't want to allude to any kind of major, you know, thing. It's a, it's a small thing. But anytime you move something around in the Hall of Justice uh, or make any changes, a fairly large number of people take an interest in that. <laughs> so we want to make sure we're being sensitive to that issue there and then the other thing i just want to mention is i, I did have a meeting uh, with uh bart this morning also uh disregarding uh budgeting process and um the out years and the timing of when or if and how we would address uh, some, some trouble in those medium term years and uh, I'll be advocating a point of view on that throughout the budgeting process. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to circle back to uh, doing business. I just remembered something uh, also. Uh, I've been gone in, I should think I was to uh, Champaign County. And one of the major spoke about parks, cars, uh, John, 
and they're in the process of either building one or completing one. And um, they were pretty proud of that. And because, you know, because of communications and the need thereof. And, you know, I wanted to say, yeah, well, we got two of them here in Fairfield County, right? But uh, well, one of the things they brought up was that uh, they actually own that superstructure and they actually rent space to other entities like cell phone and so on and so forth. I didn't know if that was an option for us or is that excluded because of the ownership? There, there is an option at the Millersport site location because that was a ground up build. Now, our tower that we handed over to the state um, is a much smaller tower. It did work for the MARC system, but it really can't handle much of the update on that tower and what's built to the, the standard of the builders tower. And I believe Marks has had some interaction with uh, vendors. I, I would think, I would think so. But that may be an option worth looking at because there's a substantial amount of money to walk. And isn't that why we build water towers? So we can put cell stuff on top of it then? You have to ask Tony on that one. But, but yeah, I mean, when we enter that into agreement, so that we don't have to maintain that tower, it becomes Mark's direction control. We, you know, so the Millersport Tower is a is a is an agreement with the, the village and the township. We don't own. Um, you did provide the equipment. You purchased the equipment to operate on that tower, and it's doing an amazing job. Um, the the new tower that just went online is doing it. But if they rent it, if we if space were to be rented on that tower for some other use, money would go to someone other than us. Is that what you're saying? We wouldn't have to worry about the at Waterworks. It cannot support any more on that tower. That, that right. works will not make money off the other way. It's because of living. At Millersport, it's outside of our control. It's possible. Thank you. Anyway, just food for thought, right? Thanks. Yeah, new business. Um, so not this Friday, but next Friday, the 18th of October. Um, in conjunction with the CCAO, we will be hosting a uh, central region, what I'm calling a housing symposium, um, getting county commissioners, economic development folks, housing folks together at the Wigwam uh, to talk about the housing fronts that we're all experiencing around Central Ohio and what we can do to uh, improve that situation. So, Lieutenant Governor is going to come out and uh, say a few words of encouragement. Uh, Kenny McDonald, um, one Columbus, will be there to. Uh, tell people, you know, what the projections are for growth. Morpsy will be there to do the same thing. We've got a panel with the BIA in planning next and myself and somebody else that I'm forgetting right now. Um, basically, it's a, a three hour program uh, designed to talk commissioners and others through uh, kind of what we've been doing here for the past couple of years. Um, in the hopes that if everybody's kind of pulling in the same direction, maybe we'll be able to loosen things up and get some houses. So at three o'clock this afternoon, after, uh, after budget hearings have concluded, I'll be meeting with uh, uh, Director Baldridge. He's the director of agriculture for the state, meeting at the fair. And then you'll have the opportunity to see Fairfield County and our wonderful fair. Last fair, we went to see somebody. Last fair, that's Mr. Bonson. Good morning. Uh, this past Thursday, the uh, budget's office issued our banking services, which will result for your contract uh, that will commence February 1st of uh, next year, 2025. Uh, other than that, we're just business as usual. Just a quick note, I made some comments the last week that uh, uh, it's happened in Western North Carolina, also Tennessee, Georgia. Now Florida is going to get hit again. So uh, definitely keep those folks in your prayers. And if you're able to, please donate to a qualified uh, charity that's helping in those areas. Thank you. How is your son? They're fine. Uh, they're back, quote unquote. Their neighbors back to normal, uh, but uh, it's just the project that has this events. It's just hard to imagine. But they're doing fine. Thank you for asking. Well, the one that uh, 
potentially could hit Florida. Um, the area they're talking about is about three feet above sea level, and they're talking about potentially a 15 foot storm surge. So it could, it could be beyond catastrophic. Yes, Jeremiah. Uh, well, I mean, thankful that it's not dealing with that here, but I agree with Jim. Let's keep continuing our prayers. They certainly need it. Anything we can do to help is huge down here. Canned goods, uh, donations, whatever. It all goes a long ways. Other than that, we're uh, we're still buttoning up our, our last handful of construction projects. Um, work we did on Refugee Road seems to be panning out really well. Things are functioning well, so um, we're, we're very happy with that. Getting ready for snow and ice, as which uh, hopefully we don't have a whole lot of, but we'll be ready for it comes we started construction on the salt barn again appreciate uh, the support on that got some more information from y'all uh, later on today on that it's really all i have right now if i may jeremiah you mentioned refugee road and as someone who travels that road every day i can tell you that the changes there have made a significant positive impact on how people move through that part of the community and uh yeah, I was hopeful that it would be really cool when it was done. You blown away my expectations. So, uh, thank you to you and your team for at least setting that up a little bit because, man, I was tougher. Appreciate that. It's always a relief with something big like that when it actually comes out the way of the numbers and the theory that we're using to do it works, works correctly. So. Mr. President, if I might, a couple of folks here mentioned the storm situation in the south there, and I wonder, John, if <clears throat> the communications you get from an emergency management standpoint, is there like a all hands on deck messaging that goes out to emergency management agencies across the country saying, we need this, we need that, we could use small teams of people to do this, or we need these supplies. Are you receiving those kinds of messages? Yeah. Exactly that, actually. And that call, it's called EMAC, Emergency Management Assistance Contact. And actually last night I was sending out our alert for Ohio. I run Ohio's team. I don't go anymore, but we we did put out, and I have about six directors already this morning saying that they're available for deployments in the next four weeks, so above the two weeks. And that's our team. That's how our team works. But when you say deployment, you're talking about administrative deployment, yeah, like people need, with gloves on moving stuff around. Local EOCs. So we will go into a local EOC. I, I spent some time in North Carolina a few years back. We just go into that environment. There's a uh, IMT incident management teams from like the city of Columbus fire. Uh, and then the, the upper echelon is the Ohio task force one. And they've obviously been deployed. They're still on deployment with care plan. And they'll just turn around and deploy back to Florida because they started off in Florida. So that, that's the system. I mean, it's, it's multi-level, but it's all under one thing called the energy management system. Thank you, Mr. President. So Jeremiah, you know, as we saw the destruction of all those roads, can you imagine? <laughs> uh, it's beyond belief, right? I, I don't know how you deal with that much destruction. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, is, it, it takes away everything that you're using, all your options and everything above. It's, you know, you just have to pray and try to do the right thing with every step. Heartbreaking, especially around Asheville, amount of destruction. So, uh, Brandon, you actually visited Tennessee. Yeah, so my family um, just got back from a family funeral in eastern Tennessee. Luckily, our family was okay. They just don't have water and don't have power. But a mile from my uncle's house, uh, there's a bridge, and it's it's okay, but it was um, shut down for a while until they inspected it, so it's fine. Um, but it's, like, total devastation a mile from his house. So, so my family's lucky, but uh, just a mile away, and then further east, I mean, it is, we drove over to see the bridge, um, and it was over a river, and the river looks like a lumber yard. I mean, it is just trees and trees just piled. Over them. You know, you saw um, pieces of homes, barns that had floated down the river from miles and miles away that were, that were there. Um, but it's just, it's really, uh, they need donations, they need prayers. Uh, I just don't even know where people, where you start. Association is pulling together and providing donations to Red Cross. Mm -hmm. That was John's suggestion from 
last week and Brandon just shared with me that there's going to be a push to for some cleaning supplies through this church. I think that's a good thing to do as well. We have our Making Numbers Count seminar on October 16th. Uh, we will in 2025 be um, organizing the Financial Leadership Academy. Very excited about those things. And in addition to that, next month you're going to hear a little bit more about some promotion and efforts around notaries. I know that's something that Brandon had some thoughts about in the past. We want to be able to make ourselves even more available than we are now. We do get referrals from the clerk of court's office and others, and we're available to provide that free service. And then finally, I just wanted to mention about the fair. Here's some fun facts. More than 1,100 animals will be weighed on 14 scales, and Patrick Brighton and Carter Corcoran are doing a tremendous job. They have um, the countless hours into the certification of the scales as well as being available at all hours, day and night. And I'm very proud of them, the work that they're doing. But 1,100 animals, it's quite a few. Um, all the information that's in and ERP, sort it, put it out where you want. Uh, it's going to be a great tool. My office and many others to be able to you know, manage that data. Okay, so real quick, any, anyone else down the line? Anything? We're running a little short on time. Rick always has something to say. Good. Sue, please, please rise if you're able to join me in the budget, please. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> there are no announcements. Mr. President, on the announcement front, I, you folks may or may not be aware, but I have an obligation the morning of October 15th that is unavoidable. And I will get through that as quickly as I can and return here uh, as soon as possible. Um, but it's a lock that I will miss the voting pattern that morning. and. The timing of my arrival for the budget hearings on the 15th is to be determined. Thank you, Mr. President. So, approval of minutes for October 1st, 2024. Send it. Second. Discussion. Seeing none, roll call, please. Mr. Fix? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. Levesey? Yes. Minutes past 3 0 from the Commissioner's Resolution 2024 10.8.8. A resolution to set a commissioner's viewing date of November 12, 2024, 12 30 p.m., and a hearing date of November 19, 2024, 7 30 p.m., to determine the necessity to establish, alter, and or widen Stringtown Road, Greenfield Township, and Fairfield County. Fairfield County Commissioners, we have items A, B, and C. Second. Discussion. Um, Mr. President, if I may. Typically, um, I think we made a mistake, but typically these go under the engineer's resolutions viewing and hearings and it ended up on here so i just wanted to point that out i don't know if it's an issue or not so noted additional discussion roll call please mr fix yes mr davis yes mr levacy yes motion passes three zero from the commissioner's resolution 2024-10.8.d a resolution approving a vacation request to vacate a portion of Allen Road, Violet Township. A motion to remove this from the table. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Fix. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. Commissioner Levesey. Yes. The motion has been, or the resolution has been removed from the table. Motion to adopt. Second. Discussion. Uh, so, I've had some conversations with Jeremiah and Tony over the past week who have been in communication with ODOT. Uh, we're trying to uh, negotiate a better deal with them on how they're impacting the land that uh, they need to uh, deal with or take to uh, get the Pickerington interchange up and running. Um, those conversations are ongoing. 
they've asked us to provide this uh, vacation so that they can keep the project moving forward, knowing that uh, we still need to conclude those negotiations at some point down the road. Um, all and say that this does not uh, minimize or reduce our negotiating situation. So I'm asking that we move this forward today so we can get the Pickerington Road interchange, keep it on track. Any additional discussion? We'll call the please. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. Levesey? Yes. Motion passes 3-0. From the Commissioner's Resolution 2024-10. 8.e, a resolution to approve a contract between Fairfield County Board of Commissioners and Meals on Wheels, Order Dollar Alternatives on, of Fairfield County. Your commissioners, I'll move items E, F, G, and H. Second. Discussion. King Dunn, roll call, please. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Lovesey? Yes. Motion passes 3-0. For the Fairfield County Auditor, Resolution 2024-10.8.I, a resolution approving an account-to-account -account transfer into a major expenditure object category, Fund 1001. Under Fairfield County Auditor Finance, we have items I and J. Second. Discussion. The first resolution is to properly classify expenditures for our next training. And the second one is the traditional allocation of PWC costs. Additional discussion. Roll call, please. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Lavacy? Yes. Motion passes 3 0. From Fairfield County Board of Developmental Disabilities, Resolution 2024 10.8.K, a resolution to approve a reimbursement for sheriff costs for Ethernet services paid to ATT as a memo expenditure for Fund 26. So moved. Second. Discussion. Seeing number roll call, please. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Lavacy? Yes. Motion passes 3-0. For Fairfield County Dog Shelter, Resolution 2024-10.8.L, a resolution approving an account-to-account -account transfer into a major expenditure object category, Fund 2002. For Fairfield County Dog Shelter, I move items L and M. Second. Discussion. Seeing them, roll call, please. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Motion passes 3-0. For Fairfield County Emergency Management Agency, Resolution 2024-10.8.N, a resolution to appropriate from unappropriated to a major expenditure abject category for EMA Fund 2091 Local Emergency Planning Committee Fire Framework. So moved. Second. Discussion. Then, roll call, please. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Motion passed 3 0. For the Fairfield County Engineer, Resolution 2024 10.8.0, a resolution to appropriate from unappropriated a major expenditure. Object category fund 2024 motor vehicle for repairs and maintenance. For Fairfield County Engineer, we have items O, P, Q, and R. Second. Discussion. I just wanted to say thanks to the auditor's office for all the help on um, getting the TID set up to where we are now. We kind of entered into a new realm of doing business. Um, moving that thing along, I want to say thank you. Additional discussion. Roll call, please. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Motion passes 3-0. From Fairfield County Job and Family Services, Resolution 2024-10.8.S, a resolution to appropriate from unappropriated the major expenditure object category for Fairfield County JFS Fund 2599 Workforce Fund. Under Job and Family Services, I'm going items S and T. Second. Discussion. Seeing gun roll call, please. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Motion passes 3 0. From Fairfield County Sheriff, Resolution 2024 10.8.U, a resolution to appropriate from unappropriated a major expenditure object category for Sheriff's Office Fund 2027 weights. Under Fairfield County Sheriff, I'm going to invite you and B. Second. Discussion. Seeing gun roll call, please. Commissioner Fix? Yes. Commissioner Davis? Yes. Commissioner Levesey? Yes. Motion passes 3-0. Payment of bills, resolution 2024-10.8.W. Resolution authorizing the approval of payment of invoices for departments that need board of commissioners approved. So moved. Second. Second. Being done, roll call, please. Commissioner Fix. Yes. Commissioner Davis. Yes. Commissioner Levesey. Yes. Motion passes 3-0. So uh, we will be going into executive session to discuss 
personnel issues. And after uh, after that uh, executive session, we'll be returning starting uh, budget hearing starting at 11 o'clock. Any additional items come before the Board of Commissioners at, at this time? I'll see she's got some. Chair, we can't do this every time. Uh, um, we've been talking about this symposium coming up on housing. Um, and I think I brought this up when I wrote here. They have, like, and I just recently read for some place, I think it's in the region, where they have, like, a tiny home development. And I just think that there are yeah. so many people that are either single or just one of the couple that that would really benefit. Trust me when I tell you, Sherry, that every single housing option is being explored to the utmost. But I appreciate you bringing it up. So, Commissioner Davis, uh, please. Yeah, I need a primer on the guest list. I'll make a motion to go into executive session to discuss personnel issues in that session. I'd like to have the commissioners. County Administrator, Deputy County Administrator, representatives from the prosecutor's office and clerks and representatives from the engineer's office. And outside counsel. Second. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 We're in the second. Thank you. 